morning. This is a re-recording of a talk I did earlier today at the Cathedral of Our Lady of Walsingham. This is now being recorded inside my house for those who are not able to hear it. Some parts of it will be modified, but it'll essentially be the same thing that the dozens of people who are inside the cathedral heard. But before we begin, let us follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, who as revealed to St. Luke the Evangelist by the Holy Spirit, began all things in prayer, no matter how mundane. With this example in mind, let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. Before thee I stand, sin to thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Several centuries ago, the Pope decreed that all the Jews had to convert to Catholicism or leave Italy. There was a huge outcry from the Jewish community, so the Pope offered a deal. He would hold a religious debate with the leader of the Jewish community. If the Jews won, they could stay in Italy. If the Pope won, they'd have to convert or leave. The Jewish people met and picked an Asian wise rabbi to represent them in the debate. However, as the rabbis spoke no Italian and the Pope spoke no Yiddish, both sides agreed that it would be a silent debate. On the chosen day, the Pope and rabbi sat opposite each other. The Pope raised his hand and showed three fingers. The rabbi looked back, raised one finger, and shook it at the Pope. Next, the Pope waved his finger around his head. The rabbi pointed to the ground where he sat. The Pope brought out a communion wafer and a chalice of wine. The rabbi pulled out an apple. With that, the Pope stood up and declared himself beaten and said that the rabbi was too clever. The Jews could stay in Italy. Later, the cardinals met with the Pope and asked him what had happened. The Pope said, first, I held up three fingers to represent the Most Holy Trinity. The rabbi responded by holding up a single finger, shaking it to remind me that there is still only one God common to both our beliefs. Then I waved my finger around my head to show him that God is all around us. He responded by pointing to the ground to show that God is also right here with us. Finally, I pulled out the wine and wafer to show that God absolves us of all our sins. He pulled out an apple to remind me of the original sin. The rabbi beat me at every move, and I could not continue. Meanwhile, the Jewish community gathered to ask the rabbi how he had won. I haven't a clue, the rabbi said. First he told me that we had three days to get out of Italy, so I shook my finger, saying no. Then he tells me that the whole country would be cleared of Jews, and I told him that we are staying right here. And then what? asked a woman. Who knows? said the rabbi. He took out his lunch, so I took out mine. Hello? My name is Christopher Chance, and I have been a parishioner at this cathedral since I was in the eighth grade. I recently graduated from the University of St. Thomas last year with degrees in Catholic theology and English literature. My professors agree, they all agree, that I'm a better theologian than a literature critic, so you don't have to worry about me talking about works that are obscure even for college students. I am also not a priest, so and thankfully nobody asked questioned me that were best asked of a priest because I was not going to answer them. But without further ado, let us proceed with this morning's talk. The cross stands at the center of our faith. It is the very reason for our faith. You cannot have the church without the cross. Not only is this clear in the scriptures, 
but it has also been seen throughout the 2000 year history of the Catholic Church, which is the mystical body of our Lord Jesus Christ. At first glance, you might be wondering what the second luminous mystery has to do with the crucifixion of Jesus, or why I dare to say that our mother in heaven was called, just like the rest of us, to follow the way of the cross at Cana. I shall make this clear throughout the talk. But before I set up the scene to discuss the evangelist's account of the wedding at Cana, I need to clarify what the church actually teaches about the Blessed Virgin Mary, as opposed to what those outside the church think that the church teaches about our mother. Although St. John Henry Newman disliked the usage of syllogisms when preaching the faith, I feel that a syllogism is a good starting point when teaching the truth about Mary. The syllogism is this. What the Church teaches about the Blessed Virgin Mary is what the Church teaches about our Lord Jesus Christ. For example, if you believe that Jesus is God and that the Blessed Virgin Mary is his biological mother, then, as logic dictates, you also believe that Mary is the mother of God. To deny that Mary is the mother of God is to ultimately deny Christ's divinity. Seems simple enough. We call Mary our mother not only because God is our father and Jesus is our brother, but also because Jesus asked her to be our mother when she approached him at the foot of the cross on Mount Calvary. Recall with me the evangelist's words that we all heard at the Good Friday service. Quote, When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. End quote. With regard to the Immaculate Conception, which refers to Mary, not to Jesus, as the pew results say that too many Catholics incorrectly believe, this dogma of the church does not deny that the cross saved all mankind from the bondage of original sin. Rather, the Immaculate Conception proves that the church believes that the cross saved all mankind from original sin. The Immaculate Conception is the belief that when Mary was conceived in the womb of St. Anne on December 8th, God rescued her soul from original sin so that she would be a pure dwelling place for Jesus at the moment of his incarnation on March 25th. But, you might ask, how could Mary have been saved from original sin roughly 50 years, give or take, before the crucifixion occurred? A reasonable question. Remember that God exists outside of time because time is a part of his creation. God can act outside of time because he is not subject to what he created. Thus, the graces given to the church from the cross are able to reach all men throughout history, and the Blessed Virgin Mary is no exception to this. Mary is held to be the first human redeemed from the bondage of original sin. Mary needed to be saved as we did. The church has never taught otherwise. Mary has been cooperating with grace and allowing it to transform her from the very beginning of her existence. To paraphrase a popular opera, the Blessed Virgin Mary is the very model of a modern major general. With this understanding in mind, let us go to the scripture passage that concerns today's talk. Well, let me move my image around so you can see the image. Okay. To quote the cathedral's pastor, Father Huff IV, in his homilies, allow me to set the stage. The Lord Jesus Christ has been baptized in the River Jordan by St. John, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him as the sign that the Father is pleased with the Son. Jesus has fasted in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, and has done spiritual combat with the devil. Jesus has called the twelve apostles to follow him, and according to the beloved disciple, the twelve recognized Jesus to be the promised Messiah to Israel. 
Jesus has not yet begun his three and a half year public ministry. It is in this context that we next find Jesus as a wedding guest in the village of Cana. St. John also tells us that Cana was the hometown of St. Bartholomew. The wedding feast seems to be going well until something truly horrible has been noticed by the serving staff. The bar is empty. The serving staff brings this horrible news to the Blessed Virgin Mary, whom the venerable Fulton J. Sheen believed was a relative of one of the people getting married. And as a side note, he also blames the wine running out due to the presence of Jesus and his apostles. Mary, being the seed of wisdom, goes to her son and asks him to do something about the wine. Jesus's response to his mother are these words, quote, woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come, end quote. St. John does not record what Mary says in response to her son's words. Instead, he records Mary instructing the serving staff with her official teaching to the Catholic Church, do whatever he tells you. The serving staff follows Mary's instruction and goes to Jesus. Jesus commands them to fill six stone jars used for ritual purification to the brim with water. Draw out some water with a ladle and give it to the head waiter to taste. The head waiter tastes it and declares that not only was this the best wine he had ever tasted, but praises the bridegroom for saving the wine until the end of the banquet. St. John notes that the head waiter, at least at this time, did not know where the miraculous wine came from, but the serving staff who gave him the sample definitely knew it was Jesus who performed the miracle. St. John also notes that the twelve began to believe in Jesus after this miracle. Wine is important. The story then ends with Jesus, Mary, his cousins, and the twelve apostles going down to Capernaum, which was shown in the other gospel accounts to be the central location of Jesus's public ministry, at least according to the works of Scott Hahn. Still have to read the church fathers to see if this was actually true or if it was just his insight, but for the sake of this talk and time, I didn't really bother to delve into that. I digress. Now that we are re-familiarized with the wedding at Cana, let us go to the purpose of my talk. One thing that always struck me as strange was Jesus's response to Mary. Woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. That seems to be an odd phrase that a son gives to his mother pleading for his assistance. And unfortunately, some both inside and outside the church have misinterpreted this passage as being disrespectful to his mother. But since Jesus never sinned, this means he obeyed the fourth commandment. So as Christians, we must not interpret Jesus's words as breaking the fourth commandment. Something else must be going on here. Now, if you take the time to study the gospel according to St. John under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, through the magisterium of the Holy Catholic Church, you've discovered that any time St. John reflects on Jesus's hour, or Jesus mentioning his hour, the hour is always referring to Jesus's crucifixion on Calvary. And now for the only cool part of this talk, let us listen to what the venerable Fulton J. Sheen had to say regarding Jesus's words to his mother. Quote, in our own language, our Lord was saying to his blessed mother, my dear mother, do you realize that you are asking me to proclaim my divinity, to appear before the world as the son of God and to prove my divinity by my works and my miracles? The moment that I do this, I begin the royal road to the cross. When I am no longer known among men as the son of the carpenter, but as the son of God, that will be my first step toward Calvary. My hour is not yet come, but would you have me anticipate it? Is it your will that I go to the cross? 
if I do this, your relationship to me changes. You are now my mother. You are known everywhere in our little village as the mother of Jesus. But if I appear now as the savior of men and begin the work of redemption, your role will change too. Once I undertake the salvation of mankind, you will not only be my mother, but you will also be the mother of everyone whom I redeem. I am the head of humanity. As soon as I save the body of humanity, you, who are the mother of the head, become also the mother of the body. You will then be the universal mother, the new Eve, as I am the new Adam. To indicate the role that you will play in redemption, I now bestow upon you that title of universal motherhood. I call you woman. It was to you that I referred when I said to Satan that I would put enmity between him and the woman, between his root of evil and your seed, which I am. That great title of woman I dignify you with now, and I shall dignify you with it again when my hour comes and when I am unfurled upon the cross like a wounded eagle. We are in this work of redemption together. What is yours is mine. From this hour on, we are not just Mary and Jesus. We are the new Adam and the new Eve, beginning a new humanity, changing the water of sin into the wine of life. Knowing all this, my dear mother, is it your will that I anticipate the cross and that I go to Calvary? Our blessed Lord was presenting to Mary not merely the choice of asking for a miracle or not. Rather, he was asking if she would send him to his death. He had made it quite plain that the world would not tolerate his divinity, that if he turned water into wine, someday wine would be changed into blood. The answer of Mary was one of complete cooperation in the redemption of our blessed Lord, as she spoke for the last time in sacred scripture, end quote. Remembering the Annunciation of her son's virginal birth by the Archangel Gabriel, and the prophecy of St. Simeon about the suffering she will have to endure. The Blessed Virgin Mary once again declares, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to your word. Mary accepts the cross when she tells the serving staff, Do whatever he tells you. As the title of the talk suggests, Jesus is calling his mother to take up her cross and follow after him. Her cross is adoring the unjust execution of her son. As the first Christian, the Blessed Virgin Mary is the first to follow the way of the cross. Once again, she is providing the example for the rest of us. Whenever the notion of carrying our cross comes up, we tend to shy away from the weight that the task puts on us. And yet, our Lord Jesus Christ makes it clear to the church when he tells her, whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. To be a Christian is to accept the weight of the cross. As I said in the beginning of the talk, we cannot escape the shadow that the cross projects over us. Jesus wants to share his whole being with us, and that includes his suffering on the cross. He came down from heaven so that we could be like him. Taking up my cross and carrying it is a noble task, no matter how hard it is for me. But Jesus does not leave us alone in carrying our own crosses. He gives us grace to pick us back up whenever we falter. On the topic of suffering, there could be an entire course we can do. And I'll be honest, there are people a lot more qualified than I to do so, but to keep it brief with respect to the time of this recording, I want to point to a curious passage from St. Paul. In his second letter to the church in Corinth, St. Paul takes the time to defend his legitimacy as an apostle and details the suffering that Jesus permitted him to endure after St. Ananias received Paul into the church. It wasn't bad enough that St. Paul faced oppression from men, but he also mentioned spiritual warfare. These are his written words, quote, Therefore, that I might not become too elated, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, an angel of Satan, to beat me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I begged the Lord about this, that it might leave me, but he said to me, 
My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. I will rather boast most gladly of my weaknesses, in order that the power of Christ may dwell within me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and constraints for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong." End quote. Contrary to popular culture, Jesus never said that we in the church would be free of suffering on our march to the kingdom of heaven. In fact, Jesus mentions several times in his public ministry that not only should the church expect suffering, but that she should count herself blessed because of it. Jesus himself was not free from suffering, and neither was the Blessed Virgin Mary. After all, as he said many times to his apostles, no servant is greater than its master. I should never think that anything I own or that has been given to me will prevent me from the call to take up my cross and follow the road to Calvary. We have two choices when it comes to suffering. We can either follow the devil's temptation to wallow in misery and make everything about us, or we can deny ourselves in humility and realize that it is not about us in the sense that we are not the center of our own universe. To be frank, as a society, we need to get over ourselves. The church does not promise that suffering would be easy, but she does remind us that we will not be alone. Jesus stretches out his wounded hand to help us. What will our choice be? So, for those in the audience who desire a more practical lesson from these talks, what does all of this mean for us? The most difficult teaching of the Catholic Church is the idea that we cannot save ourselves. In fact, the Church professes that without God's assistance, we cannot reach purgatory in heaven. Leaving us to our own devices will not end well. The sacrament of confession is a testimony to the truth that we have fallen from our original purpose. Like Mary, who was rescued from original sin at the exact moment of her conception, we need God's grace. We receive his grace from the sacraments of the Catholic Church, which were presented to you in catechesis in three groups, initiation, healing, and vocation. But receiving the sacraments isn't enough. The church does not teach once saved, always saved. In fact, the church has always condemned that position as the sin of presumption. Confession points to the reality that even if I was to be baptized into Christ's mystical body and confirmed to his holy church by the Holy Spirit, I can still fall into sin and reject God's free, undeserved gift. I need to allow God's grace to transform me into what God intends for me to be. I need to cooperate with his divine will. This means picking up my cross and following the road of suffering. Our mother in heaven is the greatest of the saints because she picked up her cross to follow her divine son first. We need to take the church's teachings seriously. In the Hail Mary, when we ask for her to pray for us now and at the hour of our death, do we actually mean this? Or is it something we recite and then go on with our lives because we tire of people asking us to join them in group prayer? My friend and fellow UST graduate once pointed out that the importance of this request to our mother in heaven acknowledges our own insufficiency when we try to do it on our own. There is nothing wrong with asking others to help us along the way. The saints understand this, and they understand the importance of God's grace. They are all the more willing to help us when we ask them to intercede for us to Christ. During this talk, or I guess recording, I pointed out that Jesus' question to the Blessed Virgin Mary at the wedding of Cana was his invitation for her to not only accept his cross, 
but for her to pick up her own cross and follow after him. I then strove to encourage all of us, especially myself, to take the church's teachings seriously and allow God's grace to transform us into what God intends for us to be. To paraphrase St. Paul, let us keep the faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Walsingham, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, due to the nature of this recording, I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, you can ask them, either privately message me or put them in the comments and I'll try my best to answer. I hope you enjoyed this recording and I hope that you have a good day. God bless.